Welcome back to What You'll Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. G'day, good evening everybody. My name is Adam Jones. Today we're getting into Good to Great by Jim Collins, who is also the co-author of the best-selling Built to Last. So I think this is his second book, Good yep. to Great. Uh, he says why, com- why some companies make the leap and others don't. And he, they went through and had a whole bunch of companies that sort of went through this transition phase mm-hmm. where they were, you know, for 15 years they were just doing okay as a company. And then for whatever reason, they just absolutely took off for this 15 years of absolute destruction and yeah. annihilation of the yeah. competition. Dominate. And so he's like, well, so why? Why did this happen? Why did these companies do well and where others didn't? Yeah. So this book is up. It's pretty big, isn't it? There's over 3 million copies sold. It's a very famous book. And well, it's been... Uh, who sort of said it on the... I think Janine Ellis said this one on the potty, Patty yep. Sanchez. A lot of... Yeah, a lot of people we interviewed recommended this as, you know, a really sick business book. Mm. It's an extremely comprehensive study, isn't it, into, like, what was in... So he calls it a black box. So a company yeah. is doing good, and then all of a sudden, they just shoot off and do great. So this whole book analyzes the black box, all the things that, that sent him great. And it's a, yeah, a five-year study, and towards the start of the book, there seem to be, like, you know, 30 or 40 researchers from university. Yeah. So, so yeah. It's, it's very hardcore by the art. I think it was... Was it the Harvard Business School or something? I think. I don't Maybe. know. Yeah. He might be making that up. Yeah, well, let's just say it. Was, <laughs> it sounds good. I think mean, he made his own. He made his own thing. I don't know. But yeah, so I think 2001, this first came out. So Built to Sell, uh, sorry, Built to Last was before that. And so he sort of, towards the end, tried to combine the two ideas. Mm-hmm. Built to Last sounds sick as well. Yeah. But I, I think there's a bit of criticism around the book in that uh, he did a third book after this. I, I should have researched before. Yeah. Actually, my pause this. I was here first time I reckon we paused mid mid recording but so I just wanted to say I should have got this before but there was a book so this was 2001 it was first published there was a book in 2009 called How the Mighty Fall and that's pretty much how um, all the companies that went from good to great all died <laughs> they all crashed Mate, so that just undermines pretty much a lot of his work the whole book and pretty much the podcast <laughs> but there's a, mate, there's a lot of good shit in there but some of the companies were Abbott Circuit City, Fannie Mae, Gillette, Kimberly Clark, Kroger, Nucor, Philip Morris, Pitney Bowers, Walgreens, Wells Fargo. Mate, a lot of them yeah. I don't even know. But. So there's a couple of banks which obviously crashed in 2008. Walgreens is like the uh, a chemist sort of pharmacy in America, sort of convenience store style pharmacy. Yeah. Philip Morris is uh, like uh, tobacco cigarettes, but also things like Toblerone and yeah. So, why they were chosen in this study. So, these companies made the leap from good results to great results and sustained those results for at least 15 years. They averaged and accumulated uh, stock returns 6.9 times the general market in 15 years during the transition. Mm. And the company had to show performance independent of their industry. So, if the industry was booming and uh, that was the reason of their yeah. uh, returns, then they weren't included in the study. Yeah. So they went through all the like Fortune 500 companies and used that as, you know, they had to dominate, like go, be more than three times better than the average market. And as you say, they couldn't have just relied on the industry going for a good run. So they whittled it down to how many? 11? Yeah. 11 good to great companies. And then what they also did, they found 11 companies in the same industry for sort of the same age, same style of company that didn't do so well. And then they found another four sort of general shit companies to mm. compare them to as well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. So, the start of the book, one of the first points it goes into is good is the enemy of great. So, we don't have great schools because we have good ones. We don't have great governments because we have mm. good ones. Mm. And few people attain great lives in large part because it's so easy to settle for just a good life. Yeah, that's it. It's because, uh, you know, it's, it seems like so much work to become great and it's easy to just settle for good. But he sort of argues throughout the book that it, it's not that much work. It's not that much more stress or pain uh, as long as you sort of do it right. But we're, we don't want to strive for great because we're, we're comfortable with good. Yeah. So, yeah, being good can be a major problem for some yeah. companies. Yeah. So, the first, so there's a bunch of findings in the research and mm-hmm. the first one being in Chapter 2, which is Level 5 Leadership. So, they had an executive which Jim Collins describes as a Level 5 leader. Yeah. And I liked, uh, so just to pull back a, a step, the... The way he's sort of broken it down, so there's six things that they say contributed to this uh, from going from good to great, and it was broken down into uh, people, thought, and action. 
Uh, and so the like two of each of those, so as you say, so the first one is the people, and the the first thing they said was this level five leadership. Yeah. So mate, well, what's the uh, level five leadership mean? So I'll start at level one and then work into yep. level five. So level one is a highly capable individual, so he's, he's making con- uh, productive contributions through his talent. Level two, you're a con- contributing team member. Level three, you're a competent manager, so you're organising people and resources for predetermined pursuit of objectives. Uh, level four is an effective leader, so the the effective leader has a vigorous pursuit of clear and compelling vision and stimulating high performance and standards. But then a level five builds enduring greatness through a blend of personal humility and mm. professional will. And that's probably what is a, the, I guess, you know, level four is that executive, uh, uh, sorry, effective leader, whereas at level five, I think the biggest element uh, that a lot of companies wouldn't have is that personal humility as well as that uh, that uh, professional will. And that, yes, they're really good at their job, but they're also, their main focus isn't themselves, uh, it's the company. A lot of CEOs, I reckon, will be pretty self, uh, yeah. So, self-centered. Yeah. yeah, you said that's one of the um, findings that they didn't really expect. They expected maybe the CEOs with the great charisma doing the big mm. keynotes and getting a million YouTube hits and all that uh, would be the ones with the great companies. But these ones, they're very quiet and they weren't in the media much at all. But what they did is they channeled their ego and their needs through the company rather than uh, meeting the needs of themselves. Yeah. And as you said, so it wasn't those big um, famous CEOs. It was more the reserved sort of quiet, weird sort of dudes who you wouldn't expect to be the um, most inspirational of leaders. Yeah. They said there was this um, duality. So they were modest, but they were willful. They were humble, but they were also fearless. Yeah. So... They, uh, part of their study is they tracked the amount of articles posted about the CEO and actually it was a negative correlation. So the more mm. articles posted about the, the charismatic CEOs, the, the less well the, their company did. Mm. And the other, th- the other um, really important thing of the, a level five leadership, which sort of ties into his Built to Last book, is that the, the bad CEOs have what he calls the biggest dog syndrome in that, you know, they're happy for a lot of dogs to be in the kennel, but they want to be the biggest dog in there. Mm-hmm. Whereas the really successful level five leaders, they want to bring the best people in and sort of have that neck train up the next wave. Whereas yep. when the, the CEO leaves, the company's still going to survive. Whereas in a lot of the dodgy, not so good companies, as soon as the big famous inspirational CEO left, the company tanked because they, they sort of killed off all the competition. Yeah. Spot on. So yeah, so he says don't don't think that just because they're quiet, a bit more quiet and humble, that they're not um, so fierce. But they're fanatically driven and with the incurable need to produce results. So if they had to for the good of the company, they'll fire their brother or something mm. like that. If that's what it took to make the company great, they'll they'll go to great lengths to do it. Mm. Yeah, ruthless. Um. And another thing with the, uh, the which was surprising for them is ten out of eleven of the great good to great companies. CEOs came from inside the company, mm. whereas the comp- comparison companies turned outsiders, where they'd get the you know the celebrity type CEO and yeah. and they churn through the CEOs at six times greater frequency. Yeah, when it came from the outside. Yeah, nice. And the the other thing I, they said a lot with these good to great CEOs, they sort of um, they didn't take a lot of the credit. They gave a lot of the credit away and also contributed a lot to luck. I think he said as well. Yeah. Um, So he says with the window and the mirror, so the level five leaders looked out the window uh, to give credit to factors outside of themselves when things were going well. When things were going bad, they looked at the mirror and Mm. took on responsibility of things going bad. Whereas the comparison companies who were doing really shit, when things were going well, they would look in the mirror. (laughs) And when things were going bad, they would look out the 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 window and blame (laughs) Blame blame the peasants. (laughs) That was a good analogy. I like the that fucking one. peasants. Yeah, and I will make a note. The book was really well structured, which made it easy to review. In that there's sort of, um, sort of these little grey boxes with the key takeaways from each section as you as you went along a sentence or two, and then plus the, the summary at the end of each chapter. Yeah, which is yeah well structured. Are you ready for the next uh, the next finding? Yeah, just one one last oh, thing. Sorry, so as, as we're wrapping up the level five leaders, so they've in summary they've got a mix of professional will and personal humility, Mm -hmm. and where you'll find these leaders, where you you look Mm. for situations where there are extraordinary and great results, but no individual steps up to take the credit, and then there's Mm. usually a level five leader 
lurking around the yep. you know lurking around the yard. That's a good point. I'm glad you, we, we talked a lot about them, but not where to find them. As yeah. you say, that yeah, that's a good way to find. My chapter three, bring us in. So that was a the second part of the discipline. People is uh, first who, then what. So rather than uh, you know, people might think that okay, this company has been doing okay for a long time, but to go to the next level, we need to have this really solid strategy. Uh, but they were saying you don't make the strategy first; you find the best people first, and it doesn't matter what the strategy is, as long as you get the he calls it get the right people on the bus, mm. uh, get the wrong people off the bus, get the right people in the right seats on the bus, and then figure out where to drive it. Yeah, that's right. So they don't. So they, the executive didn't come in and go, all right, this is our vision. This is where they're going to mm. take us. The level five leader had the humility to think, hey, I don't know. You know, I'm not the one who's mm. going to understand where we need to go. But if I get the right people around me and the right people in the right positions, then as a team, we can all figure out where the bus is going to go. Yeah. I don't know. I might be adding a bit of salt and pepper, but there was one story where, you know, someone was into the CEO was interviewed and he said, okay, so where are you going from here? And the guy said, I don't know. And everyone was like, oh, well, this company's obviously not going too far. But, you know, it took him, I think, four years to get the right people in the right spot before they even sort of formalize a strategy. Mm. Yeah, that's right. So they took the time to rather than if they need someone, they took the time that, and earned on the side of caution before they hired the right people in. Mm. So he says, people are not your most important asset, which is a popular phrase. Mm. He said, the right people are your most important asset. Yeah. 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 So good stuff. So yeah, one of the points, another point in this chapter was they, these companies were rigorous and not ruthless. Mm. So the good to great companies are really tough places to work at and uh, if you don't have what it takes you won't last very long in these companies but they are not ruthless cultures they are rigorous 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 cultures and the distinction is crucial yeah so i think to so i think in terms of the rigorous in that they have really long interview processes to and they sift through until they get the right person they don't just take the best person out of this pool of applicants if they don't have the right person They'll keep looking, yeah, and and they're really rigorous in who they find. And then once someone's in, they'll they're not ruthless, but so they give them a chance. Maybe they're just in the wrong spot. Maybe they shuffle them to a different area, mm. and they know they're good because they took so long to get them in. Yep. Um, so they just try and find something that works for for all parties. Yeah. So a ruthless company, if you're working in a ruthless company, you might be worrying about your position. But in a rigorous company, you can concentrate fully on your own work. Yeah. And I think that's also the distinction. Nice. And they say, so a, a good distinction here with the disciplined people. So he says that the genius with a thousand helpers, sort of not so good companies, they've got that level four leader that we, we talked about. And they start with what? They start with a vision. And that because this leader is such a fucking awesome bloke, so good at everything, he sets the roadmap uh, and he gets in the driving seat of the bus. And then he finds some people who can jump on the bus and just be his helping hands. Yep. Whereas the good to great... They got the big dog, the level five leader who was happy to get all the right people on first and then together they sort of set the strategy. Yeah. So yeah, there's three steps to being rigorous. Number one, when in doubt, don't hire, keep looking, as we briefly yep. mentioned. Number two, when you know you need to make a people change, act. So good to great mm. companies didn't churn more, they churned better. Mm. So they made it clear what their vision is and then set the standards and if the people didn't agree what their vision would be, they'd just get rid of them. Uh, rigorously yep (laughs) and put your best people this is a pretty cool one put your best people on your biggest opportunities and not your biggest problems yeah that's a really cool one there was one example where they said you know one guy who was the head of you know domestic sales in America and then he got moved to the head of international sales which was like 1% of the company or something and everyone thought oh this guy must have been shafted he must have been no good whereas the, the CEO was like no this is our biggest opportunity we need to grow this He's my best guy, so I'm going to put my best guy in the biggest opportunity. It wasn't like, oh, this division's mm. failing. This is a massive problem. I'm going to put the best guy on the biggest problem, get him to try and solve it. Yeah. So, so sort of, I guess, focusing on the strengths, not the weaknesses. Yeah, so I think at the start of that, it was like a very, uh, it was seen as maybe a bad move by some people because it was only mm. such a small port. It was like 1% of yeah. you know, their company was in that division. But they, yeah, they grew to uh, kill it just because this guy was a fucking superstar. Yeah. Spot on. Next one was chapter four, confront the brutal facts. Yes. So this is part of the uh, discipline thought. And so this plus the previous two is sort of part of the build up. So this is sort of the, the final stage of the build up. We're still not to the, the massive company yet. Yeah. And um, 
Yeah, so we're just building up still. But uh, yeah, confront the brutal facts, but never lose faith. Mate, shall I turn the light on? Yeah, let's get the light on. All right, we're back on. Sorry, guys. It's like it's, it's becoming it's dusk dark, now. Yeah. And um, yeah. Adam was like trying to read through the, the writing. It was clear you were struggling. So we need a bit of light, mate. Um, yeah. So where, where, where were we? Chapter four. Chapter four, confront the brutal facts. Yeah, he talks about that, uh, you know, there's, there's always going to be tough times. There's no way to get around it. Um, mm-hmm. But the, the good companies are the ones that confront these brutal facts. Yep. Took him head on. So there was throughout the whole book, there was it was littered with uh, obviously the good to great company and comparing it to the comparison companies. So in this case, there was Kroger and A and P. So in the nineteen seventies, they had both companies had all their assets invested in traditional grocery stores, just like your you know end of the corner grocery. Both companies had strongholds outside the major growth areas of the US, and both had knowledge that the world around them was changing quickly. Mm. So the cold hard fact here for them was that customers wanted not lower prices, but they wanted a different type of store. So, yeah. So, uh, so I'll just add a bit of salt and pepper. So this was sort of like the nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties. They'd gone through the war where you know there wasn't that much money going around. The economy was pretty slow because they were focused on World War Two. And so these two companies had made these, you know, convenient but pretty simple grocery stores. You could go buy your bread and milk, and that was about it. Whereas you know, ten, fifteen years on. People are getting a bit more money. The economy is um, flourishing and people want more choice, more bit of pizzazz. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so that was leading to the concept of the superstore, which is like quite popular today. So the the shit company, packed with idiots, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A&P, they defended the status quo. They hired and fired CEOs and launched fad programs. And they had these all these price-cutting strategies because their mm. old way of thinking was that people want cheap Yeah cheap costs but really at that time the cold hard facts was they want more choice yeah so Kroger understood this and they tested out the soup store concept and it was obvious that they had to change and then they went hard at changing mm. and then I think they just churned through every one of their stores and then ended up being completely invested in these super stores yeah and absolutely killed it yeah as you say both companies were in the exact same position and both saw the writing on the wall and one folk one doubled down on what they thought was working that was no longer working, whereas one embraced the change and confronted the brutal facts. Yeah. So, yeah, you want to create a culture where the truth is heard in your company. Mm. So, yeah, the, I think we're on the same part here. So, the first first step is lead with questions, not answers. So, it's, it's important to say, I don't know, ask people, um, try and gain an understanding by asking questions, not, not just the answers. Yeah. yeah. So, again, these level five CEOs had the humility to grasp the fact that, that you know they don't understand everything, so they ask questions for understanding and not for the point of manipulation. Yeah, so they didn't say, do you agree with me on this point or why did you do that? They're the wrong sort of questions. They were genuinely trying to find interesting answers for people. Uh, the second step to creating a culture of uh, truth is engage in dialogue and debate. Yeah, so... They- they said that in their, their research, they found people saying that, you know, we have, you know, loud discussions, heated debates, there's a lot of healthy conflicts, everyone gets to have their say, and I guess by everyone being able to nut out the their side of the argument, coming to a point where everyone's on the same page, everyone's got that buy-in, allow them to move forward rather than just being yeah. told what to do. Yeah, and if you've got the right people on the boat, and, and egos aren't going to get in the way. We're on a boat now. Hey, on the bus. On the bus. <laughs> <laughs> you got a plane. boat, couldn't you? Yeah, a plane. <laughs> got a plane. But yeah, the goal is to find the best answers and not to uh, have your ego yep. uh, justified. Next one is step three, which is con- 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 <laughs> conduct <laughs> autopsies. <laughs> I was going to slip that in. I don't know why. Conduct autopsies without blame. <laughs> yeah, so they're saying, you know, if something doesn't go quite right, you know, some people might go on the witch hunt, or maybe the witch hunt's the wrong word, but they might go and, they, yeah, they go out and look for who fucked this up, who's to blame, who can we who can we burn at the stake here? Yep. Whereas the good to great companies, you know, they want to look for what was wrong more as a way to what can they learn and what can they not do in future, yep. not, to, not to just slaughter someone. And number four is build red flag mechanisms. And so that's just uh, finding, putting in place, you know, ways to... Uh, Highlight when things aren't quite going right, yeah. Yeah. Raise a red red flag when um when they need. So when things do go wrong and there are red flags, there are three types of people. One, those permanently dispirited by the event. Two, those who get their life and situation back to normal. 
And number three, those who use this experience as a defining event to make them stronger. Mm. So again, with the right people, they're going to probably be the type three characters. Yeah. Nice. Do you want to talk about the Stockdale paradox? Yeah, big stocky. Jim Stockdale. So he was a high, the highest ranking US military officer in, I don't know. This, I think the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War. So he got tortured yeah. over 20 times over an eight-year imprisonment. So he's getting his ass handed to him. Mm. But when asked, he said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted only that I would get out, but that I would prevail in the end and turn this experience into the defining moment of my life. And in retrospect, I would not trade this experience in for anything. Yeah, and the important bit to note, uh, whilst what you're saying, you know, he never lost faith. But he wasn't just optimistic saying, you know, I'm going to get out, I'm going to get out, I'm going to get out next week or they'll come and save me next uh, next month. He knew that shit was bad, so he's confronting the brutal facts. But whilst confronting the brutal facts, he also retained the faith that in the end he was going to prevail. Yeah. So, yeah, those optimists you're talking about, they were the ones who didn't make it. So, they yeah. thought, I'll be out by Christmas or I'll be out by Easter. And when that time came, they weren't out. They ended up dying of a broken heart, which is yeah. kind of like what happened in uh, very similar to A Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah, and this Stockdale bloke was sort of like, listen, guys, we're not going to be out by Christmas, so fucking deal with it. Yeah, fucking deal with it. And let's move on. Yeah. And so that's sort of the paradox that, you know, yes, you know things are bad, but you still retain the faith that you're going to prevail in the end. Yeah. So, yeah, a good mixture of those two things. Nice. The Hedgehog. Big heady. I I thought this was sick. So this is where the breakthrough starts to come into play here with the hedgehog concept. And the idea is that this this essay or this fable of the hedgehog or the fox, and the fox is this elegant creature, prances around, stalks out his prey. He's got so many tricks up his arsenal, uh, and he wants to catch this and eat this hedgehog. Mm. Whereas the hedgehog has only got one move. He goes out. He's pretty slow, pretty ugly sort of uh, an animal. And he'll get his food and goes back to his hole. The fox is waiting for him. And the hedgehog just curls into a ball of spikes and the fox can't get him. And just a very simple and non-sexy kind of move, but extremely effective. Works. So so the the idea is that, you know, yes, you can be a a fox and try all these different things. But at the end of the day, you need to find that one thing that's simple, something that works. Focus on that sort of... Uh, focus on the essential stuff and ignore everything else. Yeah, so every good to great company had one hedgehog idea or hedgehog concept and everything that didn't relate to this idea of what the company was about, it held no relevance. Mm. So having this hedgehog concept kind of helped them filter their decision making and made things easier in that way. And my, my criticism of the book is that it's all this big company, big CEO stuff that I wasn't sure how you can apply to your own life. Yep. But maybe this is where it comes in, the, the three circles, find how to actually find... Your hedgehog. Yeah. So, one of the circles is finding what you're passionate about. Yep. Uh, which is... So, one example he says is like... Oh, well, actually, we'll quickly just say the three circles. Yep. I didn't get into it. So, number two is find out what you can be the best in the world at. And number three, what drives your economic engine. Yeah. And obviously, the intersection <coughs> of those three things, that's your hedgehog zone. Yeah. So, yeah, he says, for example, Philip Morris uh, had a good hedgehog concept. So, they're actually passionate about ciggies one of the top <laughs> one of the top executives that philip morris actually said it's one of the things that makes really makes life worth living <laughs> <laughs> smoking a ciggy yeah, every ciggy. hour <laughs> so good to great companies didn't say let's get passionate about what we do they said mm. we should only do the things we are passionate about and that's an important differentiation they didn't try and force the passion they found what they were passionate about and worked with those things only mate so yeah philip morris oh, sometimes I wonder how companies like that can sleep <laughs> yeah. at night, but you know they yeah. have to genuinely believe in in what they're doing. I suppose the, the, if the guys at the top are smokers, just and having a dart with their coffee in the morning and loving it, then yeah, <laughs> that is, it is a little odd. So it? yeah, the second one, what you can be the best in the world at. Mm. So it's, and, yeah, uh, so he says that it's not about you know having a goal to be the best. It's not about building a strategy to be the best. It's not about planning to be the best. It's just understanding what can you be the best at. And what are the things that you can never be the best at? Ignore those ones and just focus on what you know you could potentially be the best at. Yeah. So what are the things in your organization, what makes you unique and to be the best in the world? And just focus on that and that is your your path to greatness. Man, that's pretty much the dip. The book, The Dip, isn't it? Mm, It is. Just focus on the things you can be best in the world at, quit everything else. Man, I think a lot of business stuff you can... Uh, relate to your personal life because a lot of time yeah. business is just an extension of of the self. Mm. So, uh, number three, what drives your econ- economic engine? 
And so he said here that each company sort of had this one ratio, all different to the uh, specific company, but they all had a ratio that they knew was their key economic driver, mm-hmm. whether it was profit per customer, profit per employee, profit per visit to the supermarket, um, whatever it was, they realized what their key driver was and focused on that yep. economic engine. So again, if they if their hedgehog concept, they knew what makes their uh, company tick, this very simple metric, and all their decisions can filter just to improve that metric. Mm. And that's sort of, yeah, so the hedgehog is you find the intersection of those three things and that's what you focus on. So as you say, whether it's the business and you make all your business decisions based on that, if it's personal, then you can make all your sort of big life decisions based on your hedgehog. Yeah. Chapter six is a culture of discipline. And so this is uh, into the the final two, the, the disciplined actions. And he's saying that, you know, it's important to have this ethic of entrepreneurship uh, he says, you know, creativity, imagination, bold moves, heading into uncharted waters, uh, and this visionary zeal. But at the same time, you need to have this tight sort of culture of discipline. You can't just fly off the handle and try all this crazy shit in a big company. You've got to get to a point where it's disciplined. Yeah. So it's a it's a good balance of that entrepreneurialism and what was the second one with? Discipline. And discipline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so he says that he, he's got a good matrix here where if you've got... Low entrepreneurialism and low discipline, you're just this uh, big bureaucratic organization. If you've got high discipline but low entrepreneurship, it's hierarchical, you know, this big structure of big dogs at the top, peasants down the bottom. Yep. If you've got high entrepreneurship but low discipline, you're just a startup, whereas you need high entrepreneurship, high discipline, that's when you get to become great. Yeah, so the good to great companies build a consistent, consistent system with clear constraints, but at the same time, they gave freedom to their employees Mm. to explore whatever they needed to do. So it comes from the start. If they got the right people on the bus, so they hired self-disciplined people who didn't need to be managed. That's important. And managed the system and not the people. Yeah. So yeah, it just builds on the the concepts from the start of the book. Mate, chapter seven was... Sorry, mate. The other thing I liked in the last bit of this chapter, you know, he says a lot of people and a lot of companies have a to-do list, Mm. but he said you should also have a stop doing list. Um, again, sort of tying back to the hedgehog a little bit and that focus on the things that you're good at and everything else, make a stop doing list to not do anymore. Yep. Chapter seven was technological accelerators. Um, and this, he was saying here that all the good to great companies, they harnessed technology, but the really important thing to note, they didn't use technology to create momentum or create change. They harness the technology just to um, increase their momentum, keep them going, yeah. Yeah, so they looked at their hedgehog concept, and if the technology could help them in in terms of their hedgehog concept, then they would use it, and then there's every reason to jump fully on board with the technology and go hard at it. And he says uh, a lot of the good to great companies won awards by pioneering the use of technology, but the executives hardly talked about the technology. They just talked about their hedgehog concept and things Mm. like that. Yeah, that's it. They're just accelerating the momentum, not um, trying to create it from scratch with this brand new technology that's going to change the world. Yeah. Uh, next, mate, was the, the flywheel and the doom loop chapter. Oh, that sounds ominous, the doom it loop. It does. <laughs> <laughs> but he's saying so, it's sort of like, uh, it's either this basically a positive feedback loop or a negative feedback loop. Hmm. And that the, the flywheel, which is sort of what the six principles are based around. Yeah. So you get your consistent hedgehog concept you try and start something and you get some visible results. Everyone who's pushing the wheel gets energized by these results. Yeah. So the firewheel builds a bit of momentum, drives further, drives quicker, yeah. and then you keep so, going around the loop. Yeah, so the flywheel is like a big fuck off metal disc. <laughs> that, it's really heavy, but I didn't you know, know what a flywheel was. Yeah, I don't know. It's a big steel thing, yeah. you know, 30 foot in diameter. It's really yeah, hard. That sounds, yeah. So you're pushing really hard and then you get to one revolution and it's easy. But then over, over time, when you're putting effort, it, it starts to accelerate and uses yeah. its own momentum to spin. Almost like the uh, the compound effect, I guess. It's so hard to get it started. At the start, you probably can't even see it moving. But when you start seeing results, you get more energized to keep yeah. pushing. So all the executives said their success of their company didn't come down to one moment. It, it came down to a, a, a lot of a series of decisions. And the so the opposite of this is the doom loop. Yeah. And so this is where you know they don't know where their hedgehog um, thing is. So they'll try something... They'll get some disappointing results and that makes them react. They don't really understand, but they react. They want to do something to try and fix it. So they'll either get a new leader or a new direction, new program, new event, new product, new fad, try and buy out another company. 
But because there was no understanding, there was no hedgehog there, there was no build-up, there was no momentum, it all falls flat, and then they get disappointing results. Yeah. And obviously, that doom loop, they're going to react again and do, keep going down and down and down. Yeah. So, yeah, they're all the findings from his study, but the chapter nine, it kind of... So, he's done, you know, two huge studies, mm. built to great and... <laughs> <laughs> built to last and good to great so he tries to combine at the end uh, combine the principles to come up with a new term called enduring great companies so companies that are fucking sick yep. and they last a long time and he says so you sort of start with good to great the six things that we've talked about and once you're getting these good results then you use the I think he had four things in built to last and when you add those in that's when you get to your enduring great company yeah so yeah, I really like toward the end of the book, it goes hard on purpose and core values. And so he says mm. core values are, are essential for enduring greatness. And it doesn't matter what they are, but it, it matters that you have core values at all. Yep. So again, the idea of Marlboro, you, you know, a lot of people <laughs> think they're bad core values, but they really valued cigarettes. And, you know, because they had those core value of cigarettes, they, they did really well and Marlboro was very successful. Yeah, I think it was number one in the world. Yeah. Number one selling cigs. Um, we'll just maybe briefly touch the four things uh, from built to last m- maybe we'll do it one day but the four things were clock building not time telling the genius of and the core ideology and uh, preserve the core and stimulate progress yeah the four things from built to last so and what was a bit at the very end about uh, which I, which was sort of where it finally tied in for me where he was saying that mm. a kid came up to him in class and was like you know what if I don't want to build this massive you know, Fortune 500, billion dollar company, what if I just want to be successful? Yeah. So, yeah, moves into purpose. So, he says, if you're doing something you care about that much and you believe in your purpose deeply enough, then it is impossible to imagine not trying to make it great. It's just Mm. a given. Yeah. So, if you're working on your purpose, then naturally, you're going to try and make it great. And, And on top of that, because your your purpose is bigger than yourself, you're going to slowly morph into becoming a level five leader because yep. you're you're not doing these actions for mm. your own ego. You're doing it for the good of whatever your purpose might be. Yeah, that's sick. I thought that was a good ending. Yeah, um, right. which probably probably my criticism just got like crushed <laughs> in like the last five pages. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Mate, it's a good book. I, I thought it was good. Yeah, I like it more after reviewing it. Yes, yeah, again, my my criticism as well is. Each thing that we talked about, there was like a long couple of pages of a story of the two companies, mm. and it was good for context. But at the same time, there was a lot of sort of stories, mm. yeah. Um, which sort of, but yeah. So definitely, I think it's something a lot of it's something a lot of people can take out from this book. So, yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Man. I think as far as business books goes, this is pretty pretty well regarded. Yeah, I'd agree, mate. Yeah, very thorough research and yeah, hard to um. Yeah, go so, against. Man, are we going to do a good song or, or a fucking great song? Ooh, a fucking great, mate. <laughs> a fucking great song. Yeah! Only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick. I am the greatest. Oh, yeah, boy. Good to great. Jim Collins. Don't be good, be great. Good is the enemy of grace. It's the enemy. Good to grace! Oh, the level 5 leader is not what we expected. Be a hedgehog, don't be a fox. A fox is a cunt. A fox is a cunt. First who, then what? Gotta get Johnny Stevo and Henry on the bus in the right position. They're gonna move the bus in the right direction. Then turn the bus into a boat and then fly the plane and land on the island and burn the boat and drop the bus. Put on the accelerator all to to greatness, to greatness. The put on the accelerator. Spin that flywheel, don't fall into the doom loop. Then you're doomed. Motherfucker doom, you're gonna get doomed in the doom loop. Technology, use it as an accelerator for your hedgehog concept. Your hedgehog concept. These companies are great, I bet they're going to last forever and ever and ever. Until the economic crash, then they're all fucked. They're all fucked. The whole book just got undermined because these companies got fucked. But the one thing they had was purpose, motherfucker. Ooh. That's right, purpose. It's impossible.
possible to have a great laugh unless it's a meaningful laugh and difficult to have a meaningful laugh without a meaningful work. Oh.